Hello, good morning, gentlemen. This is Jeff Singali and Dr. Shulgin, and uh, we welcome you here tonight. It's good, uh, great that we get to have this opportunity to spend with you. What we're going to do this evening is uh, we're going to um, take a, a jaunt through Humix 101. So we are going to talk about the base technology um, as it applies to Monty's plant food and its products so that you have a basis of scientific information leading into the uh, product discussion. What I want to do first is just to uh, preface the presentation with the first slide in terms of setting a, uh, a baseline for where the science of Humix is at this present stage. I use this slide in the United States uh, and I reference chiropractic. I don't know if, if you guys are uh, use that a lot, but in the United States that was a, a practice that uh, 40 years ago was not highly recognized here. The standards weren't there. The um, acceptance in the medical community was not there, but over time that standardization did come into place and the acceptance came into place and today in the United States it's considered a regular practice. Insurance companies accept it as a practice and so on. Humix as a, as a science has really, really started to be developed in the 1950s and so we're still in the early stage of really adopting the standards of terminology and testing and really getting um, a way of, of being able to discern between truly a good active humix and, and not active humix. And so uh, Dr. Shulgin has been involved in this area of study for over 30 years, so for, for a large portion of the um, scientific development, Alexander has been involved in it and is, is one of the leading experts on this in the world. So um, this is a lot of the technology that we're going to talk about tonight. The next slide is just to say that there, is, there are key terminologies that we're going to use throughout this presentation. And I, I don't expect you to understand or read through all of these at once. We will make the, uh, the, the uh, uh, difference and discernment as we walk through the presentation about these terms. But this is what we consider to be some of the foundational terminology in this humix science. And so we want to make sure that you're fully aware of that. I want to start uh, by talking about the, the beginning point of humix. What we do in our technology is we start with a raw brown coal. A raw brown coal is mined out of the ground. The picture at the top left is a, an example of a raw brown coal um, mine. It's, it's not really a mine in, in a traditional sense, but is more of a surface a dig or a surface mine. You can see the darker brown material, that is the brown coal containing humic acids. Now you will hear these referred to by many different terms. You'll hear them referred to as lignite, leonardite, humate in some cases. Um, these terms are used interchangeably. Uh, lignite is the general term. Leonardite is a more oxidized form of lignite. It's generally closer to the surface and has been oxidized more. Once this brown coal is dug up, it gets dried in some cases. Uh, others, it doesn't need to be dried. It's crushed, screened, and turned into some form of a, of a brown coal granule. The composition of this brown coal is as such. It's primarily organic matter and minerals. If you look at the organic matter, it's comprised of primarily humic substances, 
and other organic compounds. If you dig into the humic substances, it's primarily broken into humic acids, fulvic acids, and human. Now, humic acids in this form are insoluble, and that is an extremely important point to understand at this point. Fulvic acids, however, are soluble in water, and human is, is not. Now I want to begin to talk about the composition of a humic acid. So there is an, an organic part, which is com primarily comprised of carbon and oxygen. There is a mineral part, which is comprised of things like calcium, iron, sodium, aluminum. These are the mineral parts. And then there are what we call functional groups. These are carboxyls and hydroxyl groups. Now, there's more than just those two types of functional groups. In fact, there's probably nine to ten different, uh, different types. But these are the two primary groups that operate uh, for these particular materials. So if you put this structure together, it sort of looks like this. Now, I, I will preface this in saying that humic molecules cannot be specifically um, defined like a water molecule or like an oxygen molecule or some known compound. One must uh, understand that these are derived from, uh, from organic matter and that organic matter is different uh, depending upon the, the location in which you derive it. And so this is not an exact um, structure. Uh, it is just a representation of what a humic acid molecule looks like. So you have a hydrophobic part, which is water repelling. You have a hydrophilic part, which is water attracting. And then you have these mineral parts, which, uh, which enable cation exchange to take place. The next slide that I'm going to show you uh, shows a picture, uh, a scanning electron microscope picture in the left side of humic acids. They, they sort of look like... Uh, broccoli almost or, or cauliflower. Uh, they're, they're just a clumped looking um, composition. The picture on the right is a computer model of what a humic acid molecule might look like. But these, are, these molecules in this form are shown in a natural state. Now what I want to do next is to take that model that we just looked at, and I want to simplify this model. And so I'm going to go from this picture here to the next picture. And the next picture shows a very simple blue line, blue wavy line, and that is what we call the backbone structure of the molecule. And then there are these functional groups hanging off of that backbone structure. <coughs> And I want to take one step further, and I want to add an additional piece to that, and I want to, sh I want to simplify the model to a hand, where the palm of the hand is that backbone structure, and the fingers are these functional groups. So this gives a, an easy way of being able to understand the activity and how that molecule works. And we'll use that example as we go along. Now what I want to talk about next are the differences between humic acids and fulvic acids. You hear these, these talked about. If you look at the distribution of humics and fulvics in terms of their molecular weight, fulvic acids tend to be lower molecular weight. They're smaller molecules. 
humic acids tend to be higher molecular weight molecules. They're larger, they're more volumetric in, in structure. And so this, this uh, red dashed line, it's, it's not precise. Um, it, it takes an expert in this area to be able to discern between a fulvic acid and a humic acid. But it's just to say that they're, the fulvics are, are low molecular weight, humics are a high molecular weight. And this becomes important as we go through this presentation. So the next slide talks about <clears throat> Humic acids being short chain molecules, so they're smaller short chain molecules, whereas humic acids are long chain volumetric molecules. And what happens with humic acids, because they're so much larger and volumetric, they tend to associate with themselves, they tend to, to uh, get uh, bound with clays and metals and those types of things. And so the analogy using the hand is, they look like a fist. So these humic molecules in nature look like a closed fist. 